morning and welcome to the Navigator's Bible class. We are currently studying the book of Revelation and we're in chapter 6, by the way. We have been doing the seals, going through the seals. The seals are seven judgments that God brings on this earth. They begin over here, seal 1, 2, and 3, and 4 correspond to the four horsemen of the apocalypse that people have referred to from time to time. Uh, last week we, we talked about the fifth seal. As with the first four seals, the fifth seal continues. When they start, it continues. And it ends here when Christ comes back. Um, I see somebody made a one out of my seven over there. That's my good. Here. There we go. Okay. Uh, today we're going to start the sixth seal. And this begins with verse 12. And let's read through it. By the way, the fifth seal... Uh, by the end, uh, the fifth seal brings with it a um, death of the population of 25%. And that's added to those that have died previously to this seal. So the population as we see it throughout the book of Revelation will be dwindled greatly so that there will be a small percentage. I'm not sure exactly what it will be, but by the time we get through here, we'll see that the population is greatly reduced by the time Christ comes back. The sixth seal. And as we read through these, the events are near the end of the seven years, and they lead right up to the seventh seal of the day of the Lord. So let's read them together, starting at verse uh, 12, uh, watch along with me as I read them. And, uh, and I beheld, this is John speaking, of course. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth uh, of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell uh, unto the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man. That's pretty much everybody in it hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? So powerful, powerful words. And we're going to look at this uh, uh, seal today. We're going to look at, uh, we're, after this we're going to go into chapter 7, and we'll see how far we get today. But we're on the sixth seal right now. These, uh, this seal parallels Matthew 24, 29. And I've got that bookmarked. I'll read it for you. Matthew 24, 29. And keep in mind, Matthew 24 is where Jesus answers the questions of his disciples when they ask, what is the sign of that coming and of the end of the world? And this is part of his answer. Verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Can see. So we see Jesus describing the same thing as this sixth seal in that particular verse. He describes a lot of what happens 
during this time, but that verse talks about what happens in the sixth seal. Uh, notice the great earthquake and uh, in, in verse 12, and I put emphasis on the great earthquake. You'll find this earthquake mentioned several times in the book of Revelation as the great earthquake. It's one that will happen that will literally uh, mess up the geology of the earth and to the point to where mountains are not where they were and islands are, have been moved and, and so it's going to be a great earthquake. We are sitting, uh, our earth is composed of these tectonic plates and if something really drastic happened, those things could, could move and change and it would be, we can't imagine what, what it would be other than something like this. We also see it, the stars fall from heaven. Somebody said, well, the sun's a star. If it hit the earth, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> Any star that we see out that's like our sun or whatever, if it hit the earth, it would, I mean, that we can't imagine that. So what is it talking about here when it says the stars fall from heaven? Uh, you remember in Job 38, the first five or six verses in Job 38, when God created the heavens and the earth, the brand new physical world, it said the sons of God shouted for joy and the stars shouted for joy. It speaks of the angelic beings and they are called stars in many places. Uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, stars often refer to angelic beings. And if we'll turn over a few pages to chapter 12, and I don't want to get too much into it because we'll, uh, we won't have anything to study when we get to chapter 12. But chapter 12 talks about several different uh, uh, groups and peoples and individuals. And in verse 7, John sees this. It says, And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, and he was, ca he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now keep in mind, when it talks about heaven, there are three heavens. There's the heavens of our atmosphere, in which the birds fly. There are the heavens in which the planets the stars, the galaxies, these things, that's where they exist. Uh, it's called the firmament in Genesis chapter 1. That's the second heaven. The third heaven is the abode of God. It's in eternity. It's not time. It's eternity, and that's where God dwells. And where God dwells, nothing unholy and unrighteous can be there. So it is not talking about the heaven where God dwells. It's talking about the heavens that you can look out and see at night. Where, I mean, it does say uh, that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, see? And it, this, the worlds uh, it is, uh, in which we live, the physical world, is where he is. It's where his angels are. So when we see these stars cast at earth, this is what I believe. I believe that toward the end of the tribulation period that God casts them to the earth, puts them on the earth, so that when he finally dumps his wrath out, that they will be there for that. All unrighteousness 
will be there for that event. And so we see uh, in, in this chapter, we're in 12, if you look up uh, verse, verse 12 of chapter 12, Therefore rejoice ye heaven and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. <clears throat> A short time and we'll see right at this point here when Christ comes back that's in chapter 20 uh, where uh, 21 where Satan is put in the bottomless pit at this point right here so he knows he has but a short time here and so not only do the inhabitants of the earth uh, get God's wrath poured out on him They've got the devil there, and he's taking it out on them too. And uh, all those that thought they were on his side, so to speak, are going to find out that he is not going to be friendly to them. Read Job 40 and 41. Job 40 and 41 to find out about Satan's true nature his true nature if you study and read those chapters it will be very uh, very informative okay so we get into uh, the sixth seal and we see that it, in verse 14 it says the heavens open uh, we see this also in chapter 19, verse 11, this is where it talks about the heavens open and Christ is on a white horse and he goes through and the, and the armies of heaven follow him and this event happens right there. So what we see is that the heavens open. He's ready to come back. At the end of this sixth seal, there he is, ready to come back. And uh, Matthew 12, 38 and 24, 30. I'll go to 24, 30 actually uh, and read that one to you. 24, 30 said, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. That is what follows those events that we just saw. <clears throat> And it says, Then shall all of the tribes mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The heavens open, and here he comes. Now, Matthew says, this is a sign. The sign of the coming of the Son of Man. It's a sign to everyone on the living on the earth at this time. Now you remember back when Jesus was here at his first coming, they, uh, uh, the Jews came to talk to him and said, we desire that you show us a sign from heaven. I believe that's what that Matthew 12 verse is. We, we would see a sign from heaven. They were looking for signs. And Jesus said, I'm only going to show you one sign right now. And that's the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three in, or in the heart of the, the fish, the whale. So the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. That was the sign. His death, burial, and resurrection was the only sign he was given to that generation. This generation living here will see a different sign. It will be the sign of his return. A sign is there for one reason. It's to be seen. If you see a stop sign... We hope that there's not a tree in front of it <laughs> or a speed zone sign. 
We hope there's not a bush or something in front of it because it's meant to be seen. And the sign of the coming of the Son of Man is meant to be seen. Notice what it says here back in Revelation 6. In Revelation 6, they look up in verse 15. And it tells everybody looks up. And uh, they see the one sitting on the throne. And they see the Lamb. Um, all men, verse 15 through 17, see the throne and they see the Lamb. Jesus said, they will all see me. Revelation 1-7 says, every eye shall behold him. This is not a secret event. The rapture over here, where is it? Yeah, the rapture over here is a secret event for us. See, the Lord will call us out and people will wonder what happened to those people. It will be secret, but this will be no secret. Every eye will behold him. And you see the response from the people there. They run, they hide, and they, uh, and they, well, here we go. Unsaved man's response is to God. Unsaved man always runs away from God. This is, this is kind of an important thing to stick in here for us to learn about unsaved people. We who know the Lord were once unsaved people. Okay? And Paul many times said in his epistles, you were this, but you're this now. See? Uh, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There's change there. But we were all in sin at one time and under condemnation. But in uh, Romans it says, Therefore there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And so unsaved man always runs away from God. Who's the first guy ran away from God? Adam. Adam. He ran away from God for one reason. He was a sinner. And he knew it. And the first reaction is to run away from God. And they do. They try to run. They try to hide. They call and cry for the rocks to fall on. When cornered, unsaved man <coughs> always responds with hatred and contempt. You see that as they threw the apostles off buildings, as they crucified them, as they stoned them. Uh, they hate believers. And when presented with the truth, this is the, re this is the response. Hatred and contempt. We're going to look at some of the other things in Revelation, not this morning, but when we get to the trumpets, we'll see their reaction, how they just gritted their teeth at God. They didn't repent. They just got madder and madder and madder. Uh, watch unsaved people sometimes, especially as they get toward death. They begin to be fearful. They get mad. There's no repentance in their heart that you can see. That's the reaction. One who is saved is broken and they are sorry for their sins and they cry to God for salvation. It's a different thing. These people, see, have put God off. They have gone with the beast for seven years here and now they're facing the consequences. Unsaved man always blames others. 
never himself. <clears throat> Go to Congress sometime. <laughs> they blame others. They never accept responsibility for themselves or the consequences of what they've done. They blame somebody else. Enough said. All right. Uh, he is a name caller. Unsaved man is a name caller. This Isaiah uh, verse here is one of many uh, where uh, God said uh, that one day that uh, a man will refer to good as bad and refer to the bad as good. Do you see that today? Oh, yeah. Do you see what God says is an abomination and men are saying that's good? Do you see what God just cannot stand and it's sin and yet man says that's good. But you go over here to a believer that's uh, studying his Bible and is singing in church and they say that's bad. And they won't let them meet because of whatever reason, they use COVID as an excuse to keep people from going to church. And they're calling the good bad. Mm -hmm. It didn't start in our century. Remember, Nero blamed the believers for burning Rome. And it, wow. We could go back historically, even in Scripture, and see this. Man's will. Understand this. Man's will never changes. Last week we talked about, talked about the soul as mind, will, and emotions. Mind, will, and emotions. That's what, that's what you are. The real person that lives in the house that brought you here this morning is your mind, your will, and your emotions. What you think, what you choose, what you like or don't like. Okay. This is what God said about unsaved man's will. John 5. 40, Jesus said, Ye will not come to me that you might have life. There's something there that's powerful. That will, that, that will not come to Christ. Uh, Paul said, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them the mind, see that part of the soul, of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. This verse here is a good one. Psalm 10, 4. The wicked, because of his pride, will not seek after God. Do you see what is in the mind, the will, and the emotions of the unsaved man. Okay. okay. Only God can change that in a man. Only God can change it. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Everybody ought to know that. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Before we were saved, we had a dead spirit. It was dead. The Spirit's what communicates with God. Remember it said, His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. That's how we know. We, we communicate with the Spirit of God see, that dwells in us. Well, if man is dead spiritually, there is no connection. There is no communication. God has to change that. He has to Bring that spirit alive. And it's called quickening him. Made him alive. And, by the way, there's a promise that comes along with that. Philippians 1.6 
he which has begun a good work in you <coughs> will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God starts it. Why does he start it? Because if he doesn't, no one else will. The man will not start it. He's unsaved. He's running away from God. He's got all these issues. See? So God makes the move. And when he makes the move, he finishes what he starts. But only God can change this stuff in a man. Okay, let's go on. We're still in the sixth seal. It says that they, they recognize that the day of his wrath is come. I want you to note this verse in Nahum 1-2. Uh, there are other verses beside that, but in Nahum 1-2, the truth is there very clearly stated. And it's God reserves wrath for his enemies. Not his friends. Not his people. Not his children. His enemies. That's why uh, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, God has not reserved us for wrath. He's taken us out of here before the wrath comes, do you see? Um, but anyway, these people see his wrath coming. Okay. God's wrath is detailed more in the seven vials that we will get into later in Revelation 16. So this is just, just kind of scratching the surface here in the seals. It becomes more intense in the trumpets. And it becomes very intense in the vials as we see that. Okay, the seventh seal, then, if the sixth seal is everything that leads right up to it, I mean right up to the second coming, then the, second, uh, the seventh seal, then, is Christ's return to earth to conquer. Uh, what follows in chapter 7, we're in 6 right now, what follows in chapter 7 is what we call a parenthetical passage. It's kind of like a commercial break, <laughs> you know. We're going to stop here. I mean, what he's given to us in, in seal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 is about to take a breath away, so he's going to rest a little bit and then, uh, and then give us some information. Uh, actually, this uh, chapter 7 interrupts the seals. The seventh seal comes in chapter 8, verse 1. If you flip over to chapter 8, verse 1, you've only got one verse that talks about the seventh seal. <laughs> That's it. Verse, uh, verse 1, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. There's a lot of, a lot of people that what in the world is that? That's all it says about the seventh seal. What it says is if you look at heaven, everybody's gone. <laughs> They're gone. Where are they? They're on the way back with Christ. There's silence. I don't know what the significance of the half hour is. I'm not sure. But I think what it was, was as John was contemplating this, I think he was like contemplating this for like a half hour. What in the world is going on? And before he starts writing again. We know in heaven, time doesn't exist as it does here. So this is in John's, from John's perspective. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've got a note in mind uh, that uh, says the law before the storm. <laughs> well, this is, uh, I think this is the, that the storm is happening 
but it's happening on earth. In heaven, they're gone. <clears throat> Christ has already left. Chapter 19, verse 11 has happened. The heavens are open. Here they come. Nothing's going on in heaven at that time. Okay. Let's look at chapter 7. We're going to get into this a little bit and um, uh, see some interesting things. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 3 are introductory to this chapter. They parallel chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. So both of these are parenthetical passages. And both of them talk <clears throat> briefly about the 144,000 that are sealed during the tribulation period. And so everybody has questions about the 144,000. It's, it's a topic that just seems to fuel the imagination. Who are these people? Why are they, why are they there? Why are they sealed? Where are they going? When were they sealed? There's a lot of questions, and the Bible doesn't answer a lot of them, so we have to uh, kind of focus in and, and zero in and see what we do know. And uh, what we do know is verses 1 through 3 show that the 144,000 are sealed by God before the seals begin. Now the seals begin right here at the beginning of the tribulation period when the, um, uh, after the, the uh, peace treaty is made. So let's look at verses 1 through 3. Verse, chapter 7. After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. There's nobody in their right mind thinks that, uh, that uh, this is a flat earth thing. <laughs> Everybody understands when it says the four corners of the earth, it's talking about the north, the south, the east, and the west. In other words, it encompasses the globe, no matter what direction you go. Um, this is something that the Bible, not, it's poetic type of language, and the Bible's not the only one that speaks of the four corners of the earth. We understand what it means, and we're not trying to make it mean something that it doesn't. Verse 2, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice of the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And the next verse tells you that there's 144,000. <coughs> this lets us know that these are sealed before any of the bad stuff happens. God always is going to have a witness. And these 144,000 are going to be witnesses. They will preach around the world the gospel of the kingdom and about Christ is going to come back and they are sealed that they cannot be kill they cannot be hurt which has got to be frustrating to the powers that be on the earth at that time yes ma'am since it clearly states who these 144,000 are here mm -hmm. how do the Jehovah's Witnesses think they're going to be part of this group they don't believe it literally ah. okay uh, if we go on, we find out what the Bible says about these. Uh, but before we do, it says the seal of the living God is in their foreheads. Uh, it's there. Boom. 
we don't understand if it's printed or what, but we know that they are sealed in their foreheads. We'll find a little bit more about this here. We understand that believers today, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We see these in first in Second Corinthians 1 22. We see it in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, and Ephesians 4, 30. We're not going to get into that today. Just jot those down, and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That is a spiritual sealing. I don't mean sealing. I mean <laughs> S-E-A-L-I-N-G. Sealing. We are sealed by the Spirit. It's a spiritual thing. It has to do with spiritual salvation, the salvation of our soul. It's not a physical thing. It is a spiritual thing. It refers to the fact that we are in Christ, that we have been saved spiritually that our sins have been paid for by Christ and that we are under the blood. It's a, the spiritual thing. The 144,000, as we see, it's a, will be a physical thing. They can't be killed. We know that today believers can be killed because they are. Many have been martyrs throughout the last <coughs> two millennia. But these are sealed physically so that they can't be harmed as we get into it. Now, what is a spiritual what is a scriptural principle behind this? What comes first, the physical or the spiritual? Physical. Okay, when Jesus said, seek ye first what? Kingdom the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that's spiritual. That all these things shall be added unto you. It's always we must get right with God first. And then the physical things are taken care of. So when we see God taking care of the physical things in, this, in the lives of these 144,000, we know that first... He dealt with them spiritually. So these people are saved by God, by Christ, at the beginning of the tribulation period. How? Boom! Just like that. Just like that. And some of us think, well, how could they be saved? Just like that. You were saved just like that that and you say well no I, I remember it took me a while to, to get to where I believed and, and you know then, then I decided to go forward in church and someone prayed with me and we did all this and that and the other all that followed what God did in your heart see he quickened you boom then you begin to understand a few things. Then you begin to respond to a few things. Then you begin to realize what God had done for you. Salvation begins with God. And it will begin with that 144,000 just like that. And just like that, we've run out of time. <laughs> so read chapter 7 and maybe chapter 14. <laughs> because it'll have a lot of stuff about the same bunch in there. Next week we'll get into this 144,000. Do we have a question? Okay. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it means what it says. It's not up to us to try to figure it out. But you have written it. You said that all the words of your mouth are pure 
There's nothing foreign or perverse about them. Help us to believe them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.